Welcome to the What Paramedics Want podcast series of Inside EMS, sponsored by Pulsera. Whether replacing radio reports, alerting specialty teams, or managing mass casualty incidents, Pulsera simplifies communication one tool every day, regardless of the event. Well, it's time to go inside EMS. We don't have many shopping days left till Christmas, but boy, do we have a great show for you today. But before we start, I have to bring him in. I have to bring in my partner, the one who sits to my right, always to the seat at my right, the one we call Kelly Grayson. Kelly Grayson, what's going on, KG? Oh, man, it's 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 life, love, and the pursuit of happiness, man. Just Are you stealing that from me? Uh, no, no, that's... You, you stole that from other people. Get out of here. You haven't been you saying. No, once they say, if you rip off from one person, it's plagiarism. If you rip off from many, it's research. Is that uh, what it is? Yeah. But you have to give um, credit. So Chris Sabalero says it's all about yeah. life, love and the pursuit of happiness. Yeah. Well, you know, when it, how do you know when something is really, when, you're, when your partner is going to say something really smart? It starts with what Kelly Grayson says. Oh, I see. <laughs> I had my I had my knees injected again today. So uh, Talk about that. I'm sure the listeners would love to hear about your knees. How did that? Oh go? yeah, my knees. I have paramedic knees, and and I, I note the the hint of sarcasm in your voice, sir. But I'm in a better mood because I can walk without. Well, I can walk with a lower level of pain than I normally walk with, and I lost another few pounds. I'm down to 287. So I'm where I was to... is is out of sight, and where I'm going is in sight now. So where where do you hope to be by the end of the year? By the end of the year, 275, 270, so something like that. So that's, we're talking about, so we're actually recording this show on November 13th. That gives us about six weeks to go. So yep. in our, our year-end show, we'll get the final 2024 Kelly Grayson wait. And where'd you, yeah. where, where'd you start in 24? You were up 300 and... Uh, on April the 14th of, of 2023, I was... I was 400 pounds and August the 29th of 2023, I was 385 pounds. So I have lost almost 100 pounds since I moved to the North country and 122 pounds overall. Well, Kelly, you know, it is, we joke a lot about, you know, your intelligence and the mannerisms and stuff like that. But this is, this is something really though. A lot of people have challenges with, with being overweight and they try and they try right and you know it takes you years to build up that weight and people think that they can lose it in two weeks right and you've taken an approach that is really inspiring you know so cheers to you for that and you really your health uh needed it right if you did yeah yeah it did that's it's a world of difference and um prolonging my career not that i wanted to spend the next five years on an ambulance, but there are other things in the work, but uh, at least I don't, I don't have pain getting in and out of the truck anymore. And that's a good thing. So that's helpful. So, you know, today we're going to do a little bit of discussion about culture and accountability and, you know, our, our peer over there at fire rescue one and the fire chief, uh, chief Mark Bayshore. Actually, he was the host of the fireside alpha podcast for a long time uh, he wrote a great article that uh, you and I have been talking about for mm-hmm. some time now uh, on October 24th, 2024, where is our culture of accountability? And uh, change isn't always a comfortable process, but it's essential in order to stay relevant. And we talked about this in the past show. And one of the things that when I coach people, it seems that the constant a constant discussion is, why do you have a problem dealing with change? If there's only one constant that's going to happen in the world is that change will occur. Yep. And we've grown up into this whole, you know, environment that change is a bad thing. But when you have type A personalities and people who like to control, they don't want change to happen. And a lot of times, you know, the 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 you know, when we want to control things, it's because we don't like what we feel when Mm -hmm. other people or other actions or other things in our environment affect us negatively. So a lot of times that controlling comes out of wanting to stay 
the status quo. We want everything to stay yeah. even. But as we know, Kelly, and I'm going to stop talking to give you a chance yeah. here to share about culture of, uh, a culture of accountability. We just have to be able to embrace it. And if we can embrace yeah. it, I think we'll be in a better place. Yeah. Well, the you know, what the old saying is the only one who likes change is a wet baby. But, you know, the creating a culture of accountability is uh, the devil's in the details is much harder than just saying we're going to change culture because to change culture, it has to be, in my mind, from a bottom up process. You have to have the line people at an, at an organization, the worker bees who, who generate the income, who do most of the work. Those people have to buy in. They have to pick up what you're putting down. And the only way <clears throat> you're going to affect cultural change is, is you got to get them to buy into you, to your vision. And, you know, I've spouted a, a management aphorism here and there that we won't, we won't repeat today, but you and I talked about it before the show. But it's true that if you don't get buy-in, your culture change is not going to, uh, is not going to happen. And, and Chief Bayshore talks about in his, his culture of accountability, he's mainly talking about safety in the fire service and, and in particular wearing seatbelts in the fire engines and how difficult it is to change all that. Yet we see that same sort of thing in EMS. To me, in the agencies I've worked, almost every time where, where you really change the culture and the way we look at things, it was the most effective parts were from peer pressure and other people rather than, you know, you've been a supervisor and a manager, Chris, you know that, that EMTs are going to act differently when the manager is around when the, versus when they're not around. But when you hop in the truck and your partner refuses to put it in drive until you put your seatbelt on, you know, and your partner calls you out for unsafe behavior or an unsafe practice and expects you to do the same for him and you back each other up, that's the way the, the culture changes. And you can have the strongest leadership in the world, but if you can't sell it to the people, your culture is not going to change. Yeah. And I mean, one of the things that I talk about as a leadership coach is that vision is where we're going. Strategy is how we're going to get there. What's the goals to reach the vision and culture is the behavior of the organization in reaching the vision. A couple facts here that uh, I read a study at a Stanford university a few years back, and they say that change in an organization, a lot of people don't feel comfortable with change and that's because they don't trust their leaders to go and change that. Now, if, we think, about, if we think about that from a culture of accountability, it will take two weeks to create a culture. It will take you two years. Just two weeks? Just two weeks. You can change a culture in two weeks. And that same culture that you changed in two weeks will take up to two years to change back. So that's that's where we are. Now, one of the you things... Know, one of the things right. that I think we have to look at is this is specifically talking, as you mentioned, about safety. But what grabbed my eye about this topic was, where is our culture of accountability? And when we think about a culture of accountability, this just isn't about safety. As you mentioned, you know, put your seatbelt on before we go, but it's bringing your bags into the call. It's making sure that we finish our reports before we leave, you know, before we get to the next call or before we get off shift. I mean, so we think about accountability. There are expectations that I think that we set as an organization that we don't hold people accountable to until we're made to, and then people will resent it. Yeah. And, you know, Nancy has a, has a saying on this, she, a cult or the standard is the thing you walk past. If you don't correct something, that thing that you didn't correct becomes the new standard. And, you know, then you have this whole concept of normalization of deviance where, where the, the screw up becomes the standard. And then the people who, and the standard gets ever lower because you you don't set a, a draw a line in the sand about what is acceptable and what is not. Right. This whole thing about the the culture change and and to my point about it has to start from the bottom up. You hear in EMS, you've heard it, I've heard it. Whenever we have a protocol change or, or a change in medical practice or standards, something new is out, like video laryngoscopes. You know, there were the old diehards that go, I don't need that. You know, I. Uh, I can I can tube five people falling down a flight of stairs like I'll I'll commonly say with a standard laryngoscope, 
And those very same people were 10 years before saying, I don't need a bougie or I don't need a stylet. I only use a stylet when I miss it the first time. And, and if you don't sell why that sort of thing needs to be the new standard, people are going to go with what they're most comfortable with, what they've done last. And, and you know, that they all too many people are practicing the same way they were 10 years ago. It reminds me of the, the saying that if you're, if you find yourself being the smartest person in the room, you're in the wrong room and you need to challenge yourself and, and, and learn. That's what this podcast is for me in quite some time, you know, is debating ideas with you and then listening to stuff from our listeners. But I think the selling it is the thing, you know, and Chief Bayshore points out in here, you know, the, the, the necessity of developing this culture of accountability and, and, and having other people pressure their, their peers to wear their seat belts and stuff. But unless you hit them with the fact that you're far more likely to die in an accident responding to the fire ground than you are in an accident on the fire ground, you know, and that sort of thing. When I was teaching EMT, EMS to firefighters, and, and quite a few of them were people who did not want to do EMS, they were made to do EMS, and that's a, that's a famously unmotivated, cynical student. Well, you don't tell them about all the lives they can save. What you do is you make it relevant to them. Hey, you're on the fire ground, and your captain goes down with a cardiac arrest, and the nearest ambulance is 14 minutes away. What are you going to do? You know, one thing that firefighters and, and, and police officers themselves understand that EMS doesn't is brotherhood. And, you know, you sell it in a way that this is not how you save some abstract person. This is how you save your brother. And they can buy into that. The same sort of thing has to, you know, you have to do when you change the culture in EMS or you change it in fire or, or law enforcement. You know, one of the things that you talked about that I want to go back to is, you know, when you change your process and you have accountability. And that is one of the things that I think I've learned as a leader is that we never change a process. We never change a protocol without the people who are doing the work in the room. So if we're changing a process and then shoving it down their throats, it's going to meet resistance. But to yeah. your point, it, it has to be the why. But more importantly, if you could sit these people at the table with you and say, look, we're going to have to come up with a new protocol that deals with vid video laryngoscopy. Help us write that. Help us do that. Right. Oh, yeah. From Big the medical time. director standpoint. Now, all of a sudden, they become the champions in the field and they're helping you sell it in the field. And this was a lesson I got probably back in 1986 from a chief master sergeant. And it was a really good lesson that I've used throughout my career that anytime, well, I didn't use it all the time, to be honest with you. It wasn't until I was able to uh, synthesize it later in my life that I started to do it. But anytime I change, you know, I don't consider myself to be a paramedic. I still hold a paramedic card. I'm still nationally registered as a paramedic, but I consider myself to be more of an administrator than I do as a paramedic. Yeah. I have no right to make any changes to the scope of practice of an organization, uh, of a paramedic's organ organizational duty without them being in the room with me. And that's not necessarily even the supervisors, right? So now, but one of the things that we've got to be able to think about is this, this topic goes even deeper than just safety, right? Because I think that one of the things that we have to be able to think about is we set expectation in an organization and we are very selective about who we exercise those expectations with, right? If we like you, we'll turn a blind eye to the fact that you've been laid two times this week. But if you're somebody we don't like, we're going to hang you every second that you're late from a tree for, you know, time 60 minutes. Right. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that we have to be able to do, and, and we're going to take a break here in a couple of minutes. I want to hear your thought before we yeah. do that on the other side of the break, I really want to try to examine or come up with some tips on how we develop a culture of accountability to the expectations that are set. But I'll give you a chance just to kind of retort on uh, what I just said. Well, that, that thing about holding, holding people to different standards, uh, the people outside that interaction between supervisor and employee, the golden child who never gets in trouble and the problem child who gets hammered every time they even step slightly out of line, everyone else sees that. Everyone else sees that. And that's the and culture. They are, and that's the culture. Uh, and that's, and the, that's culture. the culture. That's right. They'll go like, and the culture is 
there are two different sets of rules here. There's a set of rules that the, that the favored children get, and there's a set of rules that the rest of us get. And everything is going to be run through that psychological filter, you know, and they're not going to buy what you're doing. You, you have to be fair and uniform in the way you meet out discipline and your expectation, not just discipline. Expect the same thing of your worst paramedic as you would expect of your best paramedic make make the your your standards the floor and everyone else everyone should meet at least that floor and let people flourish beyond that but yeah. that's what i think about well let's i mean one of the things that i i want to end on is one of the things that i do as a leader is i believe in consistency we have to be consistent and one of the things that i'll ask the leadership team all the time is how have we dealt with this in the past because that's how we're dealing with it if it's yeah. something that we've not dealt with in the past, I want us to think about it critically come up with the process, yeah. and come up with it because that's the way we deal with it in the future. Now, yeah. that doesn't mean that we're stuck with that. So if I need to change how we've reacted to a process before we do that, the workforce needs to know, look, in this situation, this is how we've always acted. Now we have to change that. So in the future, as we go forward, this will be the new way that we're reacting to this process. So that's part of that culture as well. But with that said, Kelly, it's time. Let's go ahead and take a quick break. We will come back on the end of the break and let us opine on some tips on how to bring accountability into your organization. And now a word from our sponsor. Pulsera scales to meet your dynamic communication needs from routine patient alerts to managing large scale emergencies Every responder and clinician connects seamlessly. Familiar yet powerful, Pulsera streamlines your response from routine transfers to regional disasters. It's one tool every day, regardless of the event. Discover more at Pulsera.com. All right, we're back. And, well, you know, one of the things, Kelly, we're talking about accountability. And we're talking about the ability to be accountable to the expectation. And that's part of culture, right? Yeah. And I think we brought up some really good points as to we have expectation in our organization. I got to tell you, in my truck as a paramedic, I had expectation for the people who worked with me on my truck, right? And yeah. one of the expectations was I do every single assessment and you don't talk. And right, wrong, or indifferent, that was my culture right? Yeah. I wanted to do the assessment. I wanted to ensure I was on the right track. And then I made the determination if it was an e a BLS call then, or a, you know, a lower level call, then my partner would take it. <laughs> and they had to be able to pay attention to what was going on. And yeah. as they were growing every so often, I'd be like, you can do the assessment. Do you want to do the assessment? Mm -hmm. but for me, the responsibility was I was the highest level of certification on the truck. I was responsible for every single patient. I wanted to make sure that I had a full understanding of what was going on. Now, some people yeah. liked it, some people hated it, but that was yeah. my expectation on the truck. Yeah. Uh, certainly when you have a partner, a set partner, you have a little bit of different, uh, but anyway, that was, that was yeah. the expectation, right? And the culture was, that's the way we were going to do it. Yeah. Now, one of the things that we've got to be yeah. able to think about is how do we, develop accountability in a way that isn't defensive because when you hold me accountable my first question is going to be who the heck do you think you are why, why are you yeah. why are you talking to me like this but there has to be a change in mm -hmm. philosophy and focus that people should hold me accountable to the expectation of what the organization is trying to create that's why yeah. That's why I think vision is the most important document inside an organization. And I'll give you an yeah. example. In my role as the head of operations for Quick Medic, our vision statement has three components. <laughs> we want to set a gold standard for mobile care solutions. We want to become national leaders in this space, and we want to develop, and we want to have workforce fulfillment. We want to develop an organization that is the workplace of choice for our people. Okay. Now, the culture is that we need to meet that. If anybody isn't work, walking towards that vision, we should hold them accountable to say, how does this help us to become to set a gold standard? How does this help us to become leaders in our... But now when we think about that, how do we make this happen? I think, to me, 
the, the way to make it happen is the people that are going to be affected by this culture change, they, you have to give them ownership of it. And you mentioned earlier, before you make a change in protocols or policies and procedures, you bring in the people that are going to have to enact that and, and you get their input on it. That is the way to get buy-in and get them to take ownership of it. What is it they, I think it was Eisenhower that said, the leadership is the art of get something, getting someone to do something you want done because they want to do it, you know, and you, you, you give them ownership of it. And at Acadian Ambulance, for example, we have this big thing about the, the, the culture of safety. And it's not just at Acadian Ambulance. Hell, there's a, there's a national uh, continued competency program requirement for EMA, ambulance safety and the EMS culture of safety. So it, it's, it's a nationwide thing. But the way we did this was is that everyone, everyone, no matter how low on the totem pole they were, is responsible for safety. Um, and that you can call out a superior for that with uh, on a safety issue with no expectation of repercussions. And when we and we reward them for that sort of thing by give them tangible rewards when we see tangible changes and tangible improvements in our safety. And the way we did this at, at Acadian is is we had we had things like you got caught cards. So if a supervisor was around and saw a patient, uh, saw a crew member doing something the safe way, uh, the way that the, the company wants it done, and give them a you got car card. And one notable instance, I called out a supervisor on a safety issue, and she gave me a you got caught card for calling her out for that. And that, that really speaks to, the, to how to sell this, you know, that, hey, you held me accountable for this and, and how important it was. And we won our... our safety standards our district one highest rated in the company for safety standards for for years on end and we'd get things like you know walmart gift card you know 50 or 100 dollar gift card every quarter when we do when we do that to give us some some sense of ownership and how this was how this was supposed to be done i don't think that you can dictate that man i, I think that you you can no matter how charismatic you are unless you have the people who are going to be enacting the elements of this culture, unless they believe in it, it's not going to work. And I think the way to do that is give them ownership of it. This is, this is, this is not the changes. These are our changes. This is our, our uh, agency or our culture or our organization that we're looking to transform, uh, not just this is what I think you should do. So one of the things that you said earlier from is a change in culture has to start from the bottom up, not the top down. I, I think that I have to disagree with that because just because you and the truck as a paramedic want to change, want to change culture doesn't mean the culture is going to change. And you could put your own culture in, right? But you have to get everybody to move that as well. But I do yeah. think there needs to be a top down and a bottom up and we meet you in the middle approach to this. Okay, I'll but, grant you that. I, I'm not going to say it goes from the top down, but meeting in the middle, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a company. You know, I believe that in this saying, and I say this in my organization all the time, there is no one job in this organization that is more important than the other. We just have different responsibilities. But if yeah. you don't do your job, my job doesn't mean anything, right? So we have different responsibilities in this organization, but it, it doesn't mean that my job is more important than your job. Now, a lot of leaders and a lot of senior leaders don't take that approach with their workforce. I believe the workforce is the most important component to the success of the organization mm -hmm. uh, because they're the ones that's the rubber meets the road. They're the ones that meet the plus customer. They're the one that meets the client. They're the ones that take care of the patient. And if we're not taking care of those yeah. people that are on the front lines, we are doomed. But anyway, so now when we start to think about changing a culture, how do we do that in an EMS organization, Kelly? I mean, I'm an anomaly when it comes to leadership and my leadership philosophy and approach. You know, you're a paramedic. You've been a paramedic for many years. You've got a poor culture or a negative toxic culture in your organization. What do you do about it? That's a that's a loaded question. I don't know Honestly, that's loaded, in some but... agencies... Uh, I don't think it's going to change until the rotten apples retire or rotate out because it's so prevalent in some agencies. In others, um, I think you can set an example for how things are supposed to go and how things are supposed to be done, but it, it needs to be a consistent example and it can't be just one person 
trying to stand out from the crowd and, and show them a better way. Everyone else has to grasp it as well. I have been in agencies where, where we could affect change, and I've consulted for agencies where we could affect change, um, and we did change the culture. But there was a humongous turnover when we did that. Uh, but here's the thing that, that most people don't grasp is that turnover, that employee turnover is not the end of the world because the people that weren't coming to you and filling out applications or wanting to work at your agency before, when they see the culture change, now they're, they're knocking on your door. You know, we have this thing, well, we need meat in the seat. We can't fire the slug because that's going to put us, that's going to put us shorthanded and we're going to have to pay overtime to, to, to fill these slots on the truck. And, and they're, their behavior or lack of performance goes on and on and on until the people that do set a good example see what he, what that person's getting away with and they lower their standards to meet his because they ask themselves, why even bother? But if you get rid of those slugs, <clears throat> you can hire someone better to take their place. I don't know why agencies don't really understand that. John Politis calls this the, the cross-pollination of a-holes, you know, from you people that go from one agency to another and they spoil every, they're a rotten apple that spoils every bunch they're in because nobody will say this person is not suitable for EMS. They're not going to give them a bad reference. And, and quite often they just stay in place and, and ruin the whole show. You can't do that by law though. Right. So the only, well, you can, you can, you can say things. I th actually, I think you can do that by law, but, but you can't. The only thing you could say is if they're rehirable. That's yeah, you can't divulge just, certain details, but right. yes, you can you can say this person is not eligible for rehire. But you know, I I I think that setting those standards and and holding everyone accountable, if you do that from the top down and the people buy into it and hold each other accountable, you can change the culture. And and I don't know that I've seen it done in two weeks, but I have seen it done. And invariably when I've seen the culture radically change. There were a lot of new people at the end of the at the end of the trail. Well, let's do it, man. Let's get out of here. Well, hey, <clears throat> what is it in your agency that you do to promote a culture of accountability? Do you hold yourself to a higher standard, or is it just the status quo? If you can fog a mirror and you have a, a pulse and a patch, and you get on the truck. How do you get the best out of yourself, your colleagues, or if you're a supervisor, your subordinates? We'd like to know what you do at the show at ems1.com and for myself and co-host Chris Cavallero thanks for tuning in to Inside EMS and we're going to catch you guys next week